morning, everyone. So nice to be back after last week's disaster. So um, those of you who were tuned in last week will know that um, I had a big power blackout at my house just before the stream was about to start um, last week. So that was a little frustrating for everybody. Um, anyway, so I just pulled the plug on last week's uh, broadcast, but we kept going with the Space Invaders stuff. We published Space Invaders Part 2 last week, and I'm ready to go with Part 3, which is our final part of Space Invaders today. I think you guys are going to be excited to build this one. It's a, I really built this one to be easy to learn, but super authentic and super close to the original um, Space Invaders game. So please give it a try if you want to. The last part of the video uh, is going to be released today, and that's what we're going to be teaching you guys all about how to get these um, original um, um, text graphics into the game, right? So, um, so all of these scores are rendered using a text rendering engine, which is really cool. So um, I'm going to teach you guys how to do that, how to take fonts that have take it, been ripped from the original Space Invaders game and how to get them in there instead of having those ugly orange variable things. Uh, sorry, I did, wasn't showing you guys. Let me show you one more time. Yeah, so um, I've got... If you have a look at the scores here, for example, you can see that they change quite regularly here um, using this this really cool Space Invaders font instead of the default font. So that's something that I'm trying to do more often. My good friend Fane just actually managed to do that in the game that we're going to be showing you today. And um, so he actually took this same idea that I had and he worked it into one of his games. And so uh, I was quite impressed to see that. Okay, so who's with us today? I've got quite a few people on board on... Um, on the Discord, we've got Gamer Davey with us as always. Hey, Davey. Uh, he's not hooked up to the microphone. And our good friend Deck is with us today. We're going to be showing you some work that Deck did in a little bit. Hi, Deck. Are you here? Just chime in and say hi if you want. He told me that his mic wasn't working. Anymore. Okay, never mind. Okay, so Deck's mic isn't working, but he's here with us on Discord. And we have uh, Kian with us as well. Good morning, Kian. Everyone's being so quiet today. I know Thane will speak up. Good morning, Thane. Good morning. How are you? At least you'll talk to me. Everyone else is yeah, everyone else is good. everyone else ghosts me on this thing. So how has your week been, Thane? It's been pretty good. Good. Actually. Yeah, you're back I've been from actually getting into some pixel art. Oh good. Well that's interesting. Pixel art. Oh good. So we're gonna be teaching you a little bit today about um uh, uh, about character animation using um, fra frame animation. And that's the thing I wanted to show you that Luca was working on. Luca doesn't appear to be here, but um, I gave him fair warning. So we're just going to go ahead and run his um, thing today anyway. So, um, and we're going to show one of your games too, Thane, that we're going to re your our remix of the day is your, whoa, you got some noise happening back there, eh? Um, can you mute your mic, please, buddy? Yeah. Sorry about that. Minecraft, so. Oh, it's all right. It's all good. Anyway, so uh, we're going to be remixing one of Thane's games today, his um, his river rafting game. So that's going to be exciting too. And that's the one where he uses the custom um, scorecard stuff. So lots of different little things on the go today. Plus, plus I'm unveiling a brand new feature called Mr. Tomac's Marvelous Machine. That'll be at the very end. And if you stick around for that, I'll explain it um, at that point. So, um, we're good to go on the Space Invaders. I, I don't really have much more to show you on that. And as I said, the part three is going to be released in a little bit. I did want to show you a little bit of, um, of Luca's work. I'm really, I'm, I'm, it's kind of sad that he's not here today, but let's get on to that right now. I've been really interested, you guys know, in the idea of digital storytelling, using Scratch and other um, software to talk about stuff to, um, to to tell stories in school, to, to describe what you learn. If you learn about knights in history, tell a little story about knights. If you've learned about how to um, how to do um, something in math, like how to figure out the square root of something like that, do a little story about that where characters talk about it anyway. So um, one of, uh, mostly I've been teaching you guys how to do that stuff using scratch animation where we move costumes around. But um, my good friend Luca, um, who's 12 years old, is uh, has been working on frame by frame animation. I think it's really quite cool. So I'm going to show you um, a little bit about what he's been up to. 
Um, now I was hoping he could actually be here to describe what was going on while we were doing this, but it doesn't look like it. So I'm just gonna play this little video that shows off what he's doing. And then I'll give you a little demo of, um, of how this actually works in real life. So instead of um, taking sprites and moving them around from one costume to the other using coding, what, um, what Luca has been doing is drawing a frame inside of Scratch um, actually, let me get into this uh, this test file right now. I've got a little um, demo file here. So he's been grabbing, a, uh, he's been drawing like a stick man, for example, and then basically to animate it, instead of um, instead of pre-making his costumes, he's basically been duplicating his costume. So he'll go into a costume like this, right click, duplicate, and then he'll do a change to it. So um, one of these tools here, the reshape tool is really handy for that because it actually lets you bend body parts. So if I grab this arm here and add a little joint in the middle by clicking, now I can actually pick this arm up and twist it a little bit like that. And so if I want this guy to be waving his arm around in my little story, I can actually just keep coding it this way. Well, oh, sorry, so I gotta get back to the arm here. And just bit by bit, we just create a little bit of an animation that way, just by duplicating. And so he's done these very complex multi-character animations where these guys are on here, and then he moves them around the screen as well. So we'll pick the whole guy up. Um, actually, this guy's grouped. And so we can move him this way, and then move him, uh, and then duplicate, and move him again. Whoops, how did he get disconnected? All right, anyway, and so the idea is you end up playing the video, and the animation ends up working just by doing one frame at a time. So his animations are quite complicated. He's got two or 300 frames in each one. I've done a little video here summarizing what he's been working on. It takes three or four minutes, but let's go through it right now and I'll just show you guys what he's up to. Um, you guys on Discord are probably not gonna be able to see this, so you might wanna switch over to the YouTube feed so you can watch this video. All right, um, let's get to that right now. So um, Luca's handle is Piper Blueberry, and he's done this really nice little animation to, um, to introduce his channel. Luca has a Discord channel as well, and he has a, um, okay, let's see him up at work here. So you can see that he's drawing its shape. Now I've sped this up quite a bit here, but you can see how he's shaping it, just using those tools the way that I showed you a little bit at a time. And then he starts duplicating it. And every time he's moving around, he's created a second guy here, just out of the same character. And you can see every frame of animation is moving his guys around a little bit to have them do something. So raise his arm, for example, here. He's done a little bit of coding here just to switch from one animation to another. So lots of frames of animation, right? He's already at 20 frames and he just did the very beginning of his story. And so he plays it back every once in a while to see if it looks realistic and then jiggles stuff around if he needs to. So now he's done designing a little fireball. And he's gonna have this guy jump over the fireball. So he's actually, He's got his legs up in a jump position here. And as he moves the fireball, it goes right underneath his legs and then he can come back down again. So it takes a lot of patience to animate this way. This is much, uh, fairly close to the kind of animation that you would see happening um, in a real, like frame by frame cartoon animation that was being hand drawn, right? It's just, but instead of having to hand draw each frame, got a bit of a kind of, uh, oh, he's getting, he's summoning his force field right now, actually. This is what he's up to. So he's designing this little um, force wave that's going to come out from his guy. So he's counter-attacking now. It's his turn to attack. Now, 
as he's about to get hit by this force wave. Oh, and it's gonna knock him right off the screen, eh? Very cool, then he starts deleting them. doing a the end screen so at the end of this i'm actually going to i'm slowing the video down so you can see the actual final video so here it comes now oh i forgot he actually does a little bit more work so he's adding some special effects to it he's adding just some some more wave effects and stuff to it and i think he does the same thing for his um force field as well so he's just going over he's doing one last run through his um animation just to clean up the animation and do some extra features So when this is done, we'll, we're going to play back the whole animation for you at proper speed and you'll get a better look at it. Okay, here it is. Whoa. Very cool. So, well, we're, we're just playing the video over again here. So I thought that was a really, really cool little effect there. And um, so if you guys are interested in trying this yourself, it's really just a matter of drawing a couple of stick men or something simple like that, and just duplicating your frames over and over again and making little changes between frames. There's really no coding involved other than just a little bit of quick coding. Let me show you the little bit of coding that I did. It's not identical. It's not identical to what Luca did, but just something simple like this. When green flag clicked, next costume, wait a little bit, a fraction of a second, depending on how fast you want your animation to go, and just go from one thing over to the next to the next. And uh, anyway, so it's a simple procedure. I showed you guys during the summertime how to do more complex animation, like our dancing robots, for example, where you use code to command your guys to switch costumes. But in this case, this is uh, some very simple stuff that I think you might, um, I, it has a low entry level and that's what I really like about um, this kind of project. I, I could see kids even as young as grade two or grade three probably having a, a lot of fun with this kind of project. Okay, so um, that's it. I'm so sorry that Luca wasn't here today to uh, to show us the project, but, um, but maybe we'll have him on some other time to talk about his work. He does have some other projects to show us as well and I'd love to, um, have him show you some more of his animation projects. Okay, I have a couple of other um, student projects to show you. Um, my good friend Deck was very busy with Scratch this week and he did a project to celebrate Diwali, which is the, um, I believe it's the Hindu Festival of Light. It's an annual festival that happens right around this time of year. And so he did a nice little I love the sparklers and the way they wind themselves down like that. That's really actually a nice little effect you did there, Deck. And uh, the rest, of, the rest of it is all just color effects mostly. But um, I love the uh, the animation. You can see the things burning down as he's going along the way, and I think that was quite cool. Deck also has been experimenting with um, a costume changing game. I've seen a lot of these on Scratch where um, you get a character, even sometimes a historical character, and you give them different uh, dress up tools. So you can change the look of their face or change the hat they're wearing or whatever. And he started experimenting with this. Um, it's not quite there. And I'm going to do a little remix of the week on this, but probably next week, I think, because I think it's a really cool project, but it's not quite there. And um, so I'm gonna I'm not gonna press the green flag here because it just uh, makes the music play and I and that kind of distracts me. So yeah, it's just a matter of going to the arrows and you can switch the different outfits that this guy's wearing. He's also got something going for the hair color here and that's that's using a color effect and then he's got a hat here as well. So this is kind of cool and this is a fairly simple project to do. The code's really not that complicated. It's just basically play a sound and switch costume when you when you click on it so the, every time um this one of these arrows gets clicked he sent he broadcasts a message saying hat right for example then on the hat he's listening with this message when he receives hat right it's next costume right if he goes hat left then it's a little bit more complicated you have to go to the costume before that i showed him a way to get his costumes going differently uh, but it doesn't look like he 
has done that. So there is a way to do coding with costumes like this, where you go to the costume before that. And I did show that to him this week, but um, he didn't actually implement it. So instead of doing all of this kind of thing, where he's going, go to, if it's if it's A, then go to B, if it's B, go to C or whatever. You can just go, um, when I receive left, you can go uh, switch costume to, costume number and then we can do a minus one and that will actually move backward through the costume list so costume number oh i did that wrong costume number minus one and so now on the shoes that should work when i click the green flag here Yeah, and you can see we're moving backward through the costumes this way without having to do these complicated if statements that he set up here. So that's a little bit of a remix on this project there, just to show you how to do something a little more simply. So that's Dex project of the week. Um, also very, very busy has been Thane. You can jump back on again, Thane, if you want to. Okay. As long as, the, as your brothers aren't too noisy there. Um, yeah, so let's. So here's your original game. I really enjoyed this a lot. It's a bit of a rage game, though. Eh? Tell me about it while I play it here, Thane. Oh, um, I can't visit the screen. Let me just get it and reconnect again. Okay. So you're not actually seeing the screen on the Discord? Yes. Okay, now I can see. Okay, it. now you're good. Okay. So tell us about the game, Thane. So you gotta move um, your little kayak. Mm -hmm. after a bit. You gotta dodge the rocks that are moving fast. The, the rocks move super fast, eh? So you wanted this to be a... Uh, yeah, so you gotta add some eyesight. That's why you gotta... Whoa, yeah. It, eyesight and it, it, it reflexes. Yeah, it is possible. I can tell you I'm playing it right now, but it's tricky, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is quite fun. Um, he's got a really nice little animation here for the canoe tipping over. You can see, watch when I die here, how the canoe... It's just, it's just um, the guy falling out of the canoe. Out yeah, of yeah. Well, and I can't even hit this. Okay, there we go. And so we've tipped ourselves over. I really like the way that you use the uh, the text. So how did you figure out how to use the text? Did you watch a tutorial, you said? I a tutorial. Okay. So um, this is similar to what I did in Space Invaders. We've got a prefab font here with all the different letters on it. And he's just using code to basically take the score and represent it as these things. And so it's a little bit complicated because you have to because you've got a multi-digit score, so you have to tell it what to do, what to put into the first character, and then move over and put it into the second character, and move it over yeah. to put it into the third. But um, it all makes sense. Score is really just distance. Yeah, I get it. Um, anyway, so um, yeah, I think this is a nice little bit of code. So I'm going to be um, remixing this game just a little bit. So I liked your, um, I really liked your graphics for this. It's very nice and simple and clean, but I was experimenting with seeing whether I could get some nicer graphics into here. So what I did with for my remix of the week, and um, let's um, let's get going into, actually, let me play my little, um, my little intro for my extreme makeover segment here. Here we go. <laughs> All right, so we're into the extreme makeover segment right now. So this week I'm going to take Thane's game and I'm going to mess around with it a little bit. I'm not going to do it all um, live coding because um, I don't want it to take too much time. But I'm going to save a file over that you guys can have a look at here um, that has a bunch of the coding already done in it. And I, I just want to kind of walk you guys through it as we work on it. So um, number seven. So let me just go and grab the URL for that page and I will paste it into the chats. If you're joining me after the fact here, so I'm also putting into the Discord, uh, into, um, what Discord am I in here, right? Which channel? Um, oh, I'm gonna put it into, I'll put it into Ask Mr. T. All right, there you go. All right, so, um, if you're watching this after the stream, you can just find the address for this inside the description for this file, basically. Um, so let's get inside it here. What I what I decided to change about this file here was just the graphics. I downloaded an animated GIF of a um, 
of a costume here. Let me blow this up a little bit. I'm just gonna blow my browser window up here. So I've got an animation. Whoa, let's go back to my costumes that I downloaded of a little kayaker wave, wiggling his, um, his sticks around basically. And um, not sticks, his paddles around. And I just thought it would add a little bit of a graphic flourish to this. So this was an animated GIF file. So let's just, um, actually, I'm not going to show it to you yet. So anyway, he's got, oh, there's about 50 different frames of animation here. I'm just going to give you guys a quick preview of what that looks like in here. Um, though I'm, so you can see that he's kind of moving around as we're going through the game here. I'm not going to show you the death animation yet, though, because I've done some stuff with that as well. So I created the 50, let me get my screen back to a normal size here again. I tried to um, make it a bit bigger to show you. So where have I changed the code here? Basically, I took the code for his collision for when the object happens, and I created a new object called a collider here. The reason I did that was because I was afraid the paddles were gonna collide with the rocks, and that would have made the game a little bit too hard because in real kayaking, if your paddle hit a rock, it probably wouldn't tip your boat over. And so, I, and your paddle's up in the air most of the time, you can lift it up. So, it's, so collisions with the paddle aren't really that important. So all I did was I created a brand new object that it was a copy of the original guy called a collider here. And I went in with an eraser tool and just erased the costume for the paddles. And so now it's exactly the same size. And with the code here, we just move it right on top. So it's forever going right to the player. And then I took the collision code from inside of Thane's project and moved it over the collider here. And basically um, the, the original player will know that he crashed because we've got this variable called crash here that gets set to one. At the beginning of the game, it'll be set to zero. And then when we crash, it'll go to zero. Let's go have a look at um, the player code here as well. I just wanna go through this. So um, he's got some code here. This is all mostly um, Thane's original code here. So he's having the thing go to the mouse pointer and he's got it going down to a Y position. This is Y minus 100, so it's always there. And this is how he limits the movement so you can't go too far to the left. So it's matching your X position unless your X position gets too high over 126 or too low minus 124 and then it just snaps back to that position. That'll keep you in the river so that no matter how far over to the side you go, it won't let you get past the boundaries of the water. So the, the customizations that I did in here are, um, I basically, um, I switched it to the first animation here and I can't just do a next costume because I have some death costumes here. So I've got him switching costumes. He's gonna do it like 50 times. And um, if the costume equals 50, then we just switch back to the original costume again. So that'll get him cycling through the first 50 costumes. Now I got some death costumes here as well for him starting at 51. And let me show you those. And so at 51, I tossed the, um, the paddle out of his hand and have it floating backwards. And I've also erased it from here, you can see. And then I've got it still floating backwards. I'm starting to erase my character. This is something we did way back in our um, zombie horror game or a robot hunter game way back in the summertime as well. So I'm just having him delete himself. And then his poor little hat is left over. We leave that for a few frames and then we erase his hat. So I'm not sure this is better than having him tip over, but because I was working with an animated GIF, um, I couldn't really do the tipping over graphic the way that Thane did it here. Let me show you what this looks like in the game anyway. So what's happening here is when we tip over, if crash equals one, we stop this script, we stop going through our animations and we switch over to this script here that says dead. And this switches us to 51 and just run through the other 11 frames of animation when we die. But Thane also has a nice little sound effect here called crash. That's kind of the sound of something tipping over. Where did you get that sound effect from, Thane? I usually get these um, sounds that you don't usually get in Scratch by Freesound. Yeah, freesound.org is the same as the one that I used. It's a really good sound effects website and it has all kinds of cool stuff. So what do you search for to find that, Thane? I just search, I think, um, boat 
crashed crashing. Okay. Like yeah. So that's it cool. So you've got some background noise. Which which sprite is the background sound in again? It's here. Uh, no, it's in the player, I guess. Eh? Nope. Is it in the, rock? It's in the rock? No, it's not in the rock. It's not in the. Hold it. So I don't even know where your backgrounds. Oh, you got it. So oh, it's in your background in your backdrop yeah. here. It is okay. So here's something called river flowing. And so that's the only two sound effects we got going here. Then we've got the crash sound. So in order to make this work, I had to move the crash sound into the collider as well. And you guys know how to move uh, sounds from one guy to another. We just have to drag it over from here and put it into the new sprite here like that. Okay, let me show you what this death animation looks like. It's just a subtle difference. I'm not saying my game's so much better than your thing. I just wanted to show you how to basically put an animated GIF file into there. So here we go. So I've got my guy floating around here. Now here come my rocks. Oh, there we go. And you can see the death happening there. I think that's kind of a fun little death animation. Anyway, let me try to show that to you one more. Yeah, just change the graphics around. Whoop. Yeah, well, I showed you how I modified the code. I had to I had to move some of the code over into the um, collider object. And then I just did something that basically took your animation and moved it from the main stream where it was just going next costume and moved it over into two parts so that it was showing the paddling animation and then a death animation. So the whole death animation is just set up um, inside this when I received dead here. Let me show that to you again. Um, I'm just going to go... Um, Let's stop the file here, and I'm just gonna make the player graphics show up. Is it not at the front right now? Let's go to our looks menu. We'll go go to front. You know, I just got an idea for my game. What's that? Maybe I could add some crocodiles. Oh, crocodiles would be cool, definitely. Especially if they were maybe- like Crocodiles would come horizontally instead of vertically. Yeah, or maybe come from behind you or something, but slower, right? So you have to stay out of their way. That's not a bad idea. They will, and they'll keep coming after you till they get hit by a rock. Oh, I think that's a fantastic idea, actually, Fane. That sounds like a lot of fun. So let me just show you this animation one more time. I have it connected to a space key here, just so that um, so that I can run it, run through it here. So when I hit the space key, you'll see it happen. I think that looks pretty good. Yeah. Anyway, I like the way the paddle's kind of floating away and then getting sunk underwater there. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so you guys are aware that whenever you import a sprite that's already an animated GIF, and this is how I did that. I grabbed this animated GIF animation. As soon as I open it up here, you'll see that it loads all of the costumes. Here's my new guy. It will load through all the costumes, basically. So it's a really cheap and easy way to get animations into your game just by grabbing um, uh, animated GIFs from elsewhere on the web. They already have transparency in them most of the time, and so it's really easy to code these guys to... You know a really cool thing? Um, I actually went kayaking um, last trip. The last trip I did. Oh, when you went to Tennessee. So is that uh, is that what inspired you to make this game thing? No, I... When I made these games, I just searched on YouTube for a tutorial, and then I coded everything on my own. Okay, well, great. Oh, okay, all right. Oh, Deck says his microphone's working right now. Let's get Deck back on again. Deck, are you available? Nope. He's probably listening on YouTube, so he might be a few seconds behind. Okay, while we're waiting to see if Deck gets on, I just wanted to talk a little bit about his projects. And um, But if he's not available, we can just keep, uh, move on from here. So... Um, Oh, I promised to tell you guys what I'm going to be working on for next week. So let me unveil the big news about next week's project. Um, I, this is actually you again, Thane. You suggested this a few weeks ago, and I said no, and I poo-pooed it. And then I talked to Jeffrey about it, and he seems to think that he can get this running. He's been finding original graphics, and we are going to do Among Us next week. I'm really excited about that. So we're going to be doing a fun one-player version of the of the hit game Among Us. Has anyone here played Among Us before? I know you have, Thane. Yep. Yeah. Any? I don't know if anyone else has. Let me know in the chat. Anyway. I did. Oh, you did, Davy? Was that you? Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, so tell Davy, tell us a little bit about about how Among Us works. Nope. So if you the imposter, your goal is to kill everybody. And if you're crewmate, your goal is to figure out who the imposter is or complete all their tasks. 
Yeah, so it's kind of a murder mystery game where you're walking around and one person among you in this um, in this multiplayer game is a killer. It can be up to three. Up to three? But killers? Oh, really? Yeah, oh. up to four. Up to four killers. Oh, that'll be three. Okay. Anyway, so it's so it's a game where you're wandering around, um, kind of a, a almost like a futuristic spaceship interior, or something. Like and and one of and so one of you guys is uh, basically a murderer, and you're trying to murder everyone without everyone else noticing that you're the murderer. If you get caught, then you get summoned to this room where the, someone can accuse you of being the murderer. And if they're right, they win. And if discussion. Yeah, and so we talk about it, and you you say your evidence of whether this person's a killer or not, and yeah. and so what happened? What happens if you How guess? You play at one player? Well, it's gonna be uh, basically you're gonna there's gonna be AI guys running around, and you're gonna be the killer, and you're gonna have to try and kill people without getting caught. Basically, is the idea. Oh, if you get caught, you lose. Yeah, that's so. It's basically that's, yeah. That'd be pretty hard. Yeah, I think it is going to be. Anyway, so Jeffrey's working on it. He has some really good ideas, and I think we're um, we're going to be able to come up with something really cool. So so that's what we're starting up next week. It's going to have to involve scrolling as well. Probably, yeah. So it's going to be um, a big scrolling um, game with, multi with multiple rooms, probably. I'm not quite sure how he has it going, but he's quite confident he's going to get it running for next week. So I just wanted to tell you guys that's what's coming up, and I'm really excited about it. Okay. All right, so um, let me show you this new segment called Mr. Tomac's Marvelous Machine. I haven't actually done it yet. I haven't done a, a video for it yet, but um, but this is all inspired by an old project I did way back when I started Scratch, like four or five years ago. I just want to show you my original project. So I was experimenting with interactivity, basically, with the idea of um, how to make buttons and knobs and stuff like that work. So I created this project called Mr. Tomax Marvelous Machine. It's a little cheesy, but I'll show you. I'll click the green flag here, and stuff just starts randomly happening. You can click some of these buttons, and they make noises. And there's a slider knob here that works pretty nicely. And we've got sort of a weird readout thing going here. I've got some piano keys going here. And I've got this slider knob, or this um, pull down knob here that makes this happen. And this here is, and that's kind of cool. And this is a random number generator that I have here. So I'm clicking on this and it stops and gives you a random number. So the idea is I was just trying to teach kids how to make different buttons and stuff work. Now this is pretty primitive. This is back when I was just learning how to use Scratch and I didn't know how to do a lot of this stuff. So I want to kind of take this into the present tense and show you guys how to do some of this stuff using some new technology. And so what we're going to be doing in this segment here is every week I'm going to be adding a new piece to this machine here. So this week I'm working on a slider knob here, basically. And let me show you what it looks like. So we've got two pieces that I designed here. This this background piece and then this foreground piece here that, that just moves over, basically. And the idea is we want to code this guy so that we can slide him up or down so that he stays inside here so that we can't drag him off of it. And this is going to be able to control something. Now, uh, for today, I have it set up so that we're basically playing a song in the background. This code, by the way, is available for you guys to, sh to have a look at. This is the incomplete project. I'm going to be coding the last part of it with you guys to explain how some of these concepts work. Let me put this into the chat, though. There we go. And I'll put it also into, um, into the Discord chat. Ask Mr. T. Oh, I hit a button there by accident. All right, so load up this file, guys, and you can code it along with me. So let me show you what's already in here. So I've got the two sprites basically set up here. There's no code at all in the slider backdrop. It's only this sprite one here. Um, and I'll call this like knob or something. All right, it's only this um, this guy here that, um, that has some code in him. So the code right now, there's a bit of complicated math here. And so, so I did some of the math stuff ahead of time so I didn't have to teach it to you. All this does is it converts a range basically. So if I have a number, let me show you how it works. So, um, so if I have a number, um, let's say I'm counting from one to 10 and I count and so I, I'm, but I really want it to show up as a volume and volume goes from zero to 100. So how do I convert a number like two in a range of one to 10 
into a new range like uh, 1 to 100 or something, for example. So this block does all the math for you. It's basically cross multiplication and some other stuff here that we're doing. It's a little bit complicated. You don't have to understand it to get it working. So basically, if I get if I have a variable that goes from 1 to 10 and I want to change it to 1 to 100, I can do this. So let's say I get a 2. Well, we know that's going to be a 20 in the end, right? So let me click on this and I'll show you. I'll click on it once. And then let's go have a look at that variable that I created here called new value and hold it. So I set set variable to new value. Whoa. And then convert. Let me try a different number here. Five. Does it generate numbers? Okay. So something's a little off here from one to 10, maybe from zero to 99. Huh. The numbers aren't quite there. It was working for the other stuff that I'm that I'm doing here. Basically, we're trying to convert it into a different range. The reason we're doing that is because we're going to be making this slider basically change the speed. Um, I'll, I'll have a look at that math later, but um, this will still work even if the math is a little bit off on this thing. So I'm going to change the slider basically so that it's playing the song. Let me show you the song. Oh, too fast right now. So, so this. So the speed that this song is playing with is determined by the tempo. So let's set my tempo back to 60 here. And you can see that depending on what the tempo is set at here, the song will play at a different speed, right? Let's try it really fast here at 200. So I want to take this variable tempo and adjust it with this slider so that when we move our slider up, it changes. And when we move our slider down, it goes slower. So we can change the speed to faster or slower with a little bit of coding here. So I'm going to show you guys how to do that. So our two missions are to hook that variable up to the Y axis of this thing so that when the Y axis gets, uh, gets higher, it... Um, it turns into a number that we can use for our tempo. And when the y-axis gets lower, it slows down and it makes that variable slower. So we're trying to hook up. So what we need to do is set tempo to y position. Yeah, we can do that. But the problem with that is right now my y position for this guy, so this knob right now, its y position is 10. So my tempo is gonna be 10. And when I move it up to the top here, my tempo is going to be 137, right? So my only options for setting the tempo are going to be make it go from 10 to, to 137. I want it to go from maybe 20 to 200, to 120, from 20 to 120. So how do we convert that variable over? And that's what this block is about, basically. It lets us convert from one set of values to another. So we want to go from a range of um, basically 10 to 135 and convert that into a new range from 20 to 120. We also want to keep the slider inside the boundary so that no matter where we go, we can't pull it off the screen like that. Now this only works in full screen view because if you're playing a game and you're not in full screen view, you see, you can see as I try to pull this to the side, it's not letting me. So you can change this inside Scratch. There's a little feature called make it draggable. Let me show you that. Uh, no, it's under sensing actually, sorry. So set drag mode to draggable. If you change it to draggable, then we get into here. I can actually, I should, oh, am I on the right sprite? I think I have to put it into the green flag here. Let's try that again. Yeah, and so now I can move it. So if something is set to draggable, you're allowed to move it around the screen, even in full screen mode. But if it's set to not draggable, then uh, then you're not allowed to drag it in full screen mode. So in this case, the default is not draggable. So we're just going to leave it that way. Now, in order for this work to work, you are going to have to have your screen in full view, in full mode, because um, there's no draggable restriction in here in the editor. Because this is about messing around with files. It's not about looking at them, right? So um, if you're viewing it from the project page, you're also going to be able to, to um, not drag it around as well. And so this is the way most people will be playing your game or in full screen mode in the editor. You can kind of preview that. But um, so 
let's get uh, working on this anyway. So let's go grab a green flag here. Let's go when green flag clicked. Now let's have it go to the front, right? We want to have it in front of the backdrop here. So we're just going to tell it to move to the front. Let's go to our looks here. Tell it go to the front. We're going to set up its X coordinate, which uh, which is, so let's go, let's actually go set an X, Y here. So let's say go to an X, Y. The X is going to be minus 210. And I figured that out just by sliding this around, right? You can kind of move it around and then look at, at what the coordinate is in this window here. And after playing around with it a little bit, I realized minus 210 was the right spot. The starting point we want to be right in the middle. So I dragged it right around to the middle here and I saw that the Y was around 70. So that's how I set this up. So now this guy's right in the middle here every time. Okay, we're gonna do a forever underneath here. Let's go to our forever loop and we'll grab a forever. And I'm just gonna do a big if statement here um, that says we're only allowed to move this if I'm if the mouse pointer is touching the red thing and if I'm holding the mouse button down. That's really important because otherwise um, you're not going to know when you're done basically. So uh, we don't want the slider moving just when I hover my mouse over it basically. So let's go grab an and statement from our operators here and uh, we're going to put an if inside there. So I'm going to say if something and something, and let's go grab a touching mouse pointer from our sensing blocks, and we'll grab a mouse down question mark here. So that's what will stop it from working um, if our mouse isn't down. I'm going to demo that for you in a second here. So let's go set Y to mouse Y. So we're going to ch we're going to basically inside this loop here keep having our our slider follow where my y coordinate is here. So let's go set y coordinate and we're going to set it using our sensing blocks here. We've got a, an object here that's called mouse y. That's, that will tell you the current y coordinate of your mouse cursor. So if you go set, uh, set to mouse y, now Okay, let me maximize this. I'm actually gonna disconnect this music for now because we don't need it right now. Let's, cause that's getting a little distracting, isn't it? All right, so if I max this out now, let's have a little test. Yeah, I can move it up and down and you can see that I'm not changing the Y attribute at all. So it's only moving my X coordinate around. You have to do it fairly slowly. If your mouse goes off the thing, then you lose your connection with it, right? So these sliders, unfortunately, because of the way that Scratch works, um, you have to move them fairly slowly or they get a little bit lost here. So you could constantly keep resetting that X coordinate just in case things get lost. And why don't we do that just to be careful here? So inside this loop here, I'm gonna keep setting that X coordinate back to minus 210. And that will help in case, even if we're, if we're off the sprite here like this, for example, oh, it should be going right back again. Why is that not happening? So set X to minus, why is it not going back to the proper spot again? Oh, it's all, because, ah, actually we can do this outside the loop here. And then even if we pull it off here, so now if, if you're playing it and you haven't maximized it, it will, still want to pop back to that spot again here. Great. So our slider's working. The only problem is that we can pull it right off the top or right off, I'm doing it going too fast here, right off the bottom here, right? So we have to limit it. This is the same thing that Thane did in his river rafting game. He set some maximum coordinates for the X and for the Y. So let's go ahead and do that right now. I'm going to go say, where we'll add a couple of if statements here. We'll go if, uh, Thane, you want to walk me through how to do this? Okay. So for the up position, you need to start by getting the max point you want to go to. Uh, yeah, so that's 130. So what what am I going to do? Is it 137? Um, well, I, I had a look at it. And I thought, like, we'll, we'll okay, make it look so like that. Yeah, basically. So how do we code so this? Wise, yeah. So you want to say if y position is greater than 129, that's one before um, 
130, then set y to 130. Ah, uh, okay. So if y position is greater than 129, whoa, what have I done here? I hit a some kind of a help button by accident. Uh, let's get back to this. There we go. If y position is greater than 129, then we set our y position back to that spot again, right? Which is to 130. To, one, to 130. Beautiful. And that will keep it locked to the top here. So let's try that again. And when I try to move it over there, it just stops working. And then for the other position, yeah. you go down all the way to where you yeah. can go So let's do a duplicate here. And we'll say we're going to set the minimum Y position to 10, basically. And let's say a less position. So yeah. So let's grab a less than sign. So we want so to say if Y position mm -hmm. is less than 11. Less than 11. So perfect. Greater, yeah. Yeah. Then we set it. Set Y to 10. Beautiful. Okay. And so that's going to lock us up, up and down here. Beautiful. And you can see I cannot drag it off the bottom no matter how hard I try. And I cannot drag it off the top no matter how hard I try. Okay, we've got kind of this thing working now anyway. Um, okay, so I wanted to show you what happened if I didn't have this mouse down here. If I didn't have the mouse down, this would still work. But hold it, let's maximize it. Hold it, it's not working, eh? If touching mouse pie pointer... Hold it. I thought this was going to follow my mouse cursor around. No, it's not, eh? So it really does need both those objects down here to work properly. Try removing the and part. Yeah, the and and just have if touching mouse pointer. Yeah, let's try that. Good suggestion there, Davey. Yeah, so now it's following. And so you could choose to have your button working that way, right? You could just have it, so I'm not clicking. It looks the same, but basically it's like what's happening here is I'm not clicking. So this would become a hover control instead of a click control. And my clicking has no effect on it, basically. Though there's nothing to stop you from clicking. And so by adding that and statement in there, that was a good catch, Davey. All right, by, had, by adding that and statement in there, Oh, I think I've messed this up here, eh? No, this still looks good. Let me just test it one more time. All right, yeah. Then we've made it basically a, a button control so that you can... So you might choose to do it the other way if you find this a little frustrating. As I said, if you move your cursor too fast while you clicked on this thing, it's not going to work properly. Okay, so now we have to go through this um, job of turning the, this number, a range from 10 to 130, and change it into a tempo, basically. So I've already done most of the hard math for you with this custom block. Let's go drag one of these custom blocks into here. And we're gonna say, convert Y position. So let's go to our Y position here. So take that number between 10 and 130, and we'll tell it what the range is here. It's between 10 and 130. And we're gonna convert it to a new range. And I just decided what I wanted my pace to be. So I could make this different if I wanted to, but I'm gonna say I'm gonna let my tempo go from 20. 20 is the minimum you're allowed to do for tempo. So going lower than that wouldn't work at all. And um, the max I'm gonna do is 120, which is usually about as fast as music goes. We could go like 140 or 150. Let me go 140 here just for variety. So I'll show you guys that we can customize it to basically whatever you want. And then, so this little script here that we're working on here, all it really does, let me get into here a little smaller. All it does is it looks at the maximum number, which in the original number, like uh, 10, and the minimum, sorry, the minimum number 10, the maximum number 130, and compares it to the minimum and maximum I want to do. It does some cross multiplication and basically comes up with a new number so that we convert that number to what it would be if it was in that bigger range, basically. So um, you guys can feel free to copy this custom block over and use it for your own projects. It's a handy little tool, actually, that you can use. It does some of the more complex math for you. So in the end, it spits out a new variable called new value here. And we just have to take that new value and make that the tempo. So I've got my music blocks here. Um, these are add-on blocks, by the way. You have to get to them from here and click on music. So you click on the bottom left of the screen to get to those. 
And so let's go set tempo to that variable, which is a new value. We could rename that to tempo or something like that if we wanted to. I just wanted something generic if you guys want to use this in your future projects. And so there's the new variable. Actually, I'm going to rename that so that we have it. Um, yeah, so I'm going to go into my variables here. I'm going to rename variable and I'll just call it tempo. Okay, so now we've got the tempo up here. I don't even have to have a number though uh, of the name here. I could just right click and go large readout and put it at the top. And I think this is the way I'm actually gonna have it shown in the game. So let's test this out and see how it works. Oh, I have disconnected my music files. Let's reconnect those. And we'll max it out here again. So there I'm at, so I'm at 80 now. Let's move it down to a lower number. Let's move it a little faster. Let's move it a little faster. And let's move it all the way up to the top. So you can see the max number I get is 140. The minimum number I get is 20. So this is actually working the way that I wanted it to. I don't think there's a bug in the program. I just think I entered some weird information in there. So um, we can change it from 20 to 140, or I can go, let's say I wanna go up to 200 speed. I can change this little red block to 200, click the green flag again. And so now when I go up to the top here, I can go from 20 to 200 instead. So you can see how we can use that to do some very, very complicated things. Now let's say we wanted to move this whole thing down a little bit. Let's say I wanna move this slider somewhere else on the screen here. So let's move it to a new location. Um, let's say I wanna move it down here. Um, and let's move this roughly to the same location. And we'll just have to change our numbers around here a little bit. So I want my new X coordinate to be minus 24. And I want my new Y coordinate to be a range. So let's, right now it's at minus 82. Let's do that, minus 82 as the starting position. And I want my range to be at the low end, right around here, minus 152. At the top, minus 22. So let's go, um, uh, so minus 22 at the bottom and Hold it. No, minus 22 at the top, sorry. And minus 152 at the bottom. So I've just put those new ranges in there. We have to change these variables around as well. So I'm setting my X. If my X goes greater than minus 21, or if my uh, X, Y position is less than, oh wait, yeah, sorry, hold it. So we're gonna do, oh. Uh, so this goes to 20, minus 22, sorry, minus 21. And this goes to minus 152. And we're gonna go up, it's less than minus 153, I guess. All right. And so now we have to change these ranges around, right? So we still want the output to be 20 to, to two, minus 200, but we wanna put those new numbers in there. So we'll go minus 22 to minus 153. And so through the magic of all the math I'm doing here, we should still have something that goes from 20 to 200, but in a totally new location here. Let's test it out and see if that works. So what, oh, I messed up the math, eh? It's going up instead of down and down instead of up. All right, let's fix that. So I would have to take this top position and make it minus 153. And let's just make these numbers the same for now, minus 153. And our Y position here, let's make this between minus 10 and minus 10 here. And let's see if that works better. It's still reversed, eh? So that's not working properly. I think it has to do with the negative numbers in our um, in our 
converter. I haven't tried this. I, I, I thought it would actually just work automatically, but I think the negative numbers are messing it around. So I'm going to have to revisit this code a little bit and see if I can get it working with negative numbers. That's something I'm going to probably show you guys next week. So um, stay tuned for that, and I'll just show you guys how to go about fixing this. And next week, we'll add a new doodad to our machine as well. So I think that's about it for now. Um, so that's about all I want to show you guys this week. I'm really excited about getting this uh, Among Us game ready for you for next week. So let's go for that. Um, what did you guys think, Thane? Did you, um, what did you think of the, um, of the Marvelous Machine segment? I think it's actually really cool on how we add music any every day, and I think I have an idea on my head on how to make it a huge machine. Okay, good. So what I would like to um, to do is, if you guys have any suggestions for little knobs or thing like that, you can do. You can even try coding it yourself and then send it to me. I'm gonna create a remix room for Mr. Tomek's uh, marvelous machine that has all this code in it. And we're just going to keep adding to the same file every week. If one of you guys designs a new cool doodad to add to my machine, then I will do a tutorial on it, okay? So find a cool... So all we're looking at is not control knobs and sliders. Okay, great. I think one of the things I want to try is a little readout, kind of like the one that I have here, but where we're actually using sine waves to... Oh, I don't have my project up here anymore. Uh, let me try going back. Nope, that's not working. So here's my original thing. You, you saw this swirly readout that I have in here. I'm actually going to make it, I think I'm going to use that sign function we were using the, the other week. I'm going to show it to you here. I'm going to use that sign function to have a little sine wave inside the window here so that it, um, so that it looks really cool that way as well. And that's one of the things I'm going to do. I'm going to show you guys how to do these kind of levers and knobs and buttons and stuff too. So we're going to add a little bit every week. If you guys have a suggestion, please feel free to um, to save it into the uh, remix room for Mr. Tomek's Marvelous Machine. And um, I will sh maybe um, incorporate it into my lessons for next week. All right. So um, it was nice working with you guys again. I'm going to say bye to Davey and Deck and Kian. And of course, my good friend Thane, who's the only person who seems to talk to me nowadays. And uh, thank you, Davey, for helping out as 